Okay, so uh, I welcome you all for the Wednesday Colloquium. And before I introduce today's speaker, I request all of you to please keep your mobiles either on silent or on airplane mode so that you don't disturb the colloquium and others. Okay, great. So uh, today we have uh, a special speaker. Uh, who is a coordinator of our colloquium, uh, Professor Jyotish Mandas Gupta, uh, my VSRP buddy, and that's why I have taken this responsibility of introducing him to you. Okay, so uh, Jyotish Man is a physical chemist from DCS, uh, did his PhD from uh, Princeton in uh, 2006, and after four years of postdoc at uh, University of California, Berkeley, he joined TFR in 2010, and uh, he, he has been awarded as a Young Scientist Award in 2017 by Asian and Oceanian uh, Photochemical Society, uh, Photochemical Association, and also got the Best Emerging Young in Investigator Award in, chemical, in Chemistry of Materials Meeting in 2018. Um, he's also chosen as an editorial advisory board member in JCP, JPC, and JPC Letters. Uh, and one of my favorite uh, thing that I would like to mention is he's the founding member of Fluorescent Society. Okay. Um, so I mean, that's, the, that's the best thing, I feel. Okay. His research interests are uh, designing new materials for photo-induced uh, charge uh, generation. Uh, developing new photoreaction methodologies and time resolved optical spectroscopy of pi conjugated materials. And today he's going to talk about. Why this keeps coming down? Okay. And today he, today he's going to talk about multi exciton generation in organic molecules uh, via singlet exciton fission. So, Jyotishman. Thank you, Eva. Um, thank you for putting yourself up there to introduce me and uh, uh, bringing back VSRP days. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I, I, of course, host this series, but um, it always gets to me when I give a talk. So pardon my <clears throat> nervousness a bit. Um, so today, um, I'm going to sort of speak to you about uh, multi-exciton generation. And uh, since the crowd is very divergent, and um, I hope there are physicists, chemists, and biologists all here, um, I will try to go step by step in explaining what this really means. And then, of course, everybody in the room knows organic molecules. If you were not to know organic molecules, you should go back to school days. Um, and, um, uh, and of course, um, introduce a term to all of you that's marked in red, singlet exciton fission. We'll go through this um, in a pedagogical manner so that everybody is with me. But first, let's actually bring the context. Why do we care about multi-exciton generation? What is multi-exciton generation? So multi-exciton generation refers to creation of multiple excited states at the same time after absorption of a single photon. So a single photon absorption creates not one excited state, but more than one, two, three, four, whatever. Where is the significance? The context is, of course, solar energy conversion. Mm -hmm. We all know we are living in a world where the energy resources are going to be at crunch because of the ever demanding usage of energy by all of us. Um, and one of the paradigms that is going to give some uh, you know, uh, relief to the problem would be solar energy conversion. If you could use the energy that the sun provides every day to you in ways, creative ways that you can exploit and generate electricity, it would actually help you light things up, move in a car, 
or have a complete building which is completely powered by what sun's light is giving you okay and this in itself is something that is a paradigm changing effort in india and uh, if you were to look at what the indian government has said it's actually um, based on the needs of what the the country needs in the next 10 years we will have to have 800 gigawatt power as a necessity to run this country and what the government has done is it has laid a roadmap for 100 gigawatt one eighth of that requirement through solar energy and that is a massive task where are we right now this is the uh, sort of a circle or a semi uh, or an arc of the 100 gigawatt um, sort of mark we are somewhere here at 30 percent of it at the present moment the country generates 30 gigawatt of solar power okay and that's still one third the next over next seven years we'll have to fill that bridge that gap now there is a slight tifr connection to this problem and um i am not sure how many and i would give a show of hands right now i will ask all of you have you heard about dd kosambi how many have heard about dd kosambi um so i would say 10 percent maybe in this crowd eight out of 80 or something so that is abysmally small because dd kosambi was a major mathematician in the in our institute from 1946 to 1962 and he was not just a mathematician he was a polymath which means he could do multiple things simultaneously and um, not just in mathematics uh, but also has contributions i don't know if vidita knows this vidita is here today um, kosambi laid out a genetic map distance formalism for looking at how far genes are in a single chromosome and that has been used quite a bit in genetics but that's not the point i brought kosambi here kosambi in almost 1950s was a proponent of solar energy and at that time kosambi had a lot of other varied interests and beliefs political beliefs homi bhaba who was close to nehru believed in nuclear power and that's what Nehru delivered for Bhaba. And that's where we have the DAE, we have the money coming in. That's how we have been sort of well fed. Kosambi had differences. Kosambi believed that, and it could be actually gotten, you can read this book in Amazon. You can get it from Amazon. Uh, there is a, I don't think there's a Kindle version, but there is a version which is online available, um, where he has clearly stated out that based on the amount of sunlight and the kind of agricultural driven economy that we are, we should think of storing sunlight and do something with energy, solar energy conversion technologies. We should bring it right in the 50s when nobody was thinking about it. That's the kind of vision he had. Of course, um, he had to leave TIFR for reasons that you could go back and look into the archives. Um, but then he went in to become an eminent historian. He wrote the first complete book on Indian ancient history. And then, of course, his very popular genetics work has been referred multiple times. Um, apart from that, he was a number theorist. So this is the amount of things he could do. But imagine if Kosambi's proposal were to be accepted by Nehru. It would be a slightly different ballgame for our country, okay? Now, how has that, you know, progressed till now? That's the question. The question is addressed in some form of a very complex graph, which I have, uh, you know, sort of taken on from the NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which is the standard setter for all sorts of solar cell efficiency measurements across continents okay so nrel releases these charts every month and what i call as efficiency worms the word worms is taken because i love cricket 
And in cricket, there is, of course, this, uh, you know, this run rate worm that people display to, you know, say, how, what is the run rate? This is essentially some sort of an efficiency rate increase, right? So what you have is, you can see from the, from the era of 1975 to 2023 that we are currently living in, there is all sorts of technologies. There are all sorts of technologies dominated by silicon and gallium arsenide for the single junction solar cell. That means, let me define, the single junction means there is one single PN junction to make the solar cell, okay? Then you could also have three junction, two junction, four junction solar cells, which are sort of museum archive kind of a thing. It's, it's, it's being used for very specific applications with huge uh, conversion efficiencies up to 45%. Typically, um, uh, it just by using the laws of thermodynamics and the uh, Carnot cycle, you cannot take more than 33% out from the solar power, okay? So anything above 33%, which is defined as the Shockley quasar limit, you cannot do in a single junction. But you can go to multiple junctions and you can push these numbers up and up for certain specific applications, but this makes the entire solar cell very expensive. Only designated applications have uh, been, you know, sort of like in satellites. Okay, so the rest of the world has been sort of, this is where the research scheme is all around because all of these materials are expensive, okay? And the fabrication cost takes a lot of money. That makes the emerging PV, which is called emerging photovoltaic um, sort of ideas to be the more exciting ones because they are pushing the efficiency numbers at a higher efficiency rate. If you can see, these are the bunch of, these are the bunch of, um, bunch of guys that I have put all of everything to um, sort of rest. Only these are the ones that are highlighted. You can see there are sort of numbers which go all the way from 13%, I will read that out to you, to 32%. Now this 32% number is um, sort of a tandem solar cell where you used two different materials to create a high efficiency number, but this is not what we will sort of look at, but only single material, single junction solar cells, which have reached up to 25%. Who are the winners? Well, the winners are something called as perovskites. For those who don't know, this is actually a, a sort of an extended metal oxide material, okay? And you can have uh, metal oxides, metal halides, um, all sorts of things in, in these octahedral. And you have another cation to sort of compensate the charge at a site which we call as an A site, just by crystallographic symmetry considerations. Um, and these are typically, they have been there in the solid state physics literature for a long time for multiple applications, but they were first sort of put together by Miyazaki in Yokohama for solar cell generation uh, when they published a famous paper in 2009 with a 6% solar cell based on this material. And um, then Henry Snaith came along and made this a smooth conversion of a technology that has reached to 25%. So, um, so these two people have really delivered this material to all of us for different applications, not just solar cells, but light emitting diode applications and other classes of applications. Um, superconductivity was also one of the kind of uh, ideas that was tested on these kinds of systems. Um, the other generation of materials, which the chemists really love, by the way, chemists are also designing these kinds of perovskites without any question, but uh, more traditional chemists who like organic molecules, like to make molecules in the lab, they have this, um, fascination for using these conjugated, pi-conjugated molecules and sort of make devices out of it. And Michael Drexel was the first guy in 1991 who reported in a Nature paper that I can make a solar cell using a dye, a molecular dye like a chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, which is used by plants extensively. Our nature uses chlorophyll. So 
Michael Gretzel was one of the um, sort of pioneers of this particular material to make it into a solar cell. It was called as a dye-sensitized solar cell. Some of you may have heard this name. I'm sorry for Michael's uh, misrepresentation of name. It is not Mikhail, but it's Michael. And, um, uh, and Richard Friend pushed this technology from just small molecules to polymers, and he is in Cambridge. So all of these have sort of pushed the technologies the organic polymers have gone up to 18%, as you can see, uh, along with quantum dots. The perovskites have reached almost 26%, which tells you that something is special with these classes of materials. It also tells you silicon is no longer the only option for us. Okay, And that's where chemistry and chemists have a huge role in shaping how the next strength of five years are as we push towards 33% on all of these counts, okay? So um, let's first now, with that background and context, let's understand what is so fundamentally challenging in designing a solar cell. So let's start from excitations. Let's start from how and where light absorbs, um, you know, the molecule absorbs light. So in typical um, semiconductors, there's a band gap, all of us, pretty much have studied that in high schools and colleges, that there is a valence band, there's a conduction band. When you have this band gap, you have a chance to photo excite electrons from the valence band to the conduction band, creating holes and electron pairs. In typical semiconductors like silicon, which is extensively used for a solar cell, these holes and electrons are at room temperature are not really seeing each other. They don't have a strong Coulombic interaction. And that sort of enables a plane junction to work reasonably well. You can pull the electrons out at the junction to the n-type and pull the holes back on the p-type. So this creates electricity in the device. Once you separate these charges, okay? Now, in a non-typical semiconductor like an organic semiconductor, these excitons are formed and they are strongly bound. They are strongly bound because the electron excitation in a molecule is pretty much localized in that framework. It's not a gas like in metals or in semiconductor, right? It's not an extended wave function. It is very localized and that makes the interaction of the electron. If the electron doesn't have space to move around, it will see the hole right next to it. And the Coulombic interaction will increase, not just because of that, but because these materials also have a very poor screening. The dielectric constants of organic polymers are abysmally small. And if you remember from the Coulombic interaction formula, the dielectric constant comes in the denominator. If you have a small dielectric constant, larger the interaction. So this is why in organic polymers, we call these excitations as Frenkel excitons, which is very localized in space, while in the inorganic semiconductors, they're pretty delocalized, are called the Warnier Mott exciton. Uh, Mott, of course, has a lot of contribution in solid state physics defining insulators. So now this is the idea. So you, you see that this binding energy, it's called EBE, exciton binding energy, if it is large, we dumb is at a cost. So you have to remove these electrons and holes. So typically in a dye-sensitized solar cell or any solar cell which has large exciton uh, binding energies, you typically get up to 18%. And this is the best material actually, best report. And you see how the energy spectrum is captured by the solar cell. Um, typically dyes absorb somewhere in 500 to 1000 nanometers visible spectrum. Um, you actually do not make use of entire, so this, this cumulative amount is the entirety of solar spectrum that it looks like in wavelength dependent is the sunlight, how it looks in the color, uh, color distribution. You can clearly see that only a portion of it, 33% can thermodynamically be absorbed for electricity generation. The rest is waste. And how much are you wasting? 67%. Most of it is thermalization. That means 
The band gap of the material is that by this, but you are, you are having solar radiations which are beyond the band gap or quite a bit higher than the band gap. What happens then? What happens is molecules or materials have relaxation pathways by which it loses that excess energy to the environment. And now if you can capture that, somehow this 33% number is bound to go up. But this is accounted in the calculation which was first done by Shockley Quasar. So the, the thermalization. Uh, compared to KT in the organic system. What is the binding energy? Okay, That's a great question. So in typical inorganic semiconductors, these are around 10 to 20 milli electron volts. Yes. In the organics, if you now, there are different variations. If it was just a simple molecule, these are in the EVs, okay, electron volts. If it was an organic polymer, it would be 100 to 200 milli electron volts. So these are large numbers simply because the, the dielectric constants are very poor. So now um, the thermalization loss is something that is a bothersome view. So you have to think of ways to capture light as best as you can. So, yes. Not absorbed components in the IR. Yeah. There, there are lots of not absorbed components in the IR. If, if you are, if your molecule has no absorption spectrum in the IR, you're losing them as well. Yes. And, uh, the, extraction loss. the extraction losses are defined as when you still have the material painted on the electrode, you have an efficiency for the charge injection. You might create charges, but that injection is also a problem. So there are lots of ways in which you can lose that energy. And not just that, there could be, there could be thermal, there could be just losses uh, to the different, um, you know, the barriers and interface are coupling are important okay. to set up. Going in non which is heats of the material. Yes. It gets into polons and stuff. Absolutely. Okay. And there is polon relaxation and other things. Okay. So uh, you're saying that that can be, Captured back. Yes, that, that can be captured back. We will, we will, we will, yes, we will, we will, we will, we will talk about that. So, so this is what the idea is. Okay. Now, there's also thing. This thermalization means you are losing the excess heat uh, of the excited states, right? You have charge. You may have charge carriers that are hot, but they're cooling down without the injection. Okay. Hot carriers, hot carriers right? So, how has nature thought about this? So, let's go back to biology. Okay. Um, photosynthesis. If uh, some of you have gone through photosynthesis in school. You might think photosynthesis is amazing. It just takes, you know, chlorophyll, uh, there is light, and you produce, um, you know, a food, which is you, you reduce CO2 to carbohydrates, right? If you were to do a calculation, photosynthesis actually is 1% efficient. Photosynthesis wastes 99% of what it gets from the sun. It's only 1% that it uses. So there is a lot of wastage. However, we should not ignore it simply because it is beautifully set up. And we will just visit that right now. So, yes. Yes, it's about the cost as well. So. So at what cost are you delivering it? So, um, so here is the here is here's the scheme of what nature does. Nature has hierarchical hierarchical structures of chlorophylls that funnels energy from a higher energy uh, state or higher energy excited state to a lower energy excited state, and it does that with a beautiful array of well-aligned chromophores as an aggregate sitting on a protein and a membrane protein. These are called light harvesting complexes. These light harvesting complexes have enormous enriching physics. They are a fantastic source for inspiration for how exciton migration can be controlled and localized. And this has been quite a bit of uh, sort of uh, work for many theoretical physicists, biophysicists, to understand the mechanistic details of how from a higher energy chromophore, you funnel the energy, excitation energy, to 850 to 875, and then to something called as the reaction center, where the real photochemistry is going to take place, where catalysis is going to happen. So all of these have to be super efficient. 
super efficient means you need to get at least 100% conversion after photon excitation. And it does that by channeling exciton migration as claimed by Graham Fleming and many others in a quantum mechanical manner. Um, but we are not going to bring that in right now, but there is a beautiful sort of architectural reason why energy flows in as it is in these systems. And um, unfortunately, chemists are not able to reproduce these as best as biology does. And that is one of the big challenges. As a chemist sitting in a room where I'm talking right now, if you can build this architecture that works as efficiently as a plant does for just the energy migration part, you are actually going to bring home a lot of new technologies, not the solar cell, but you're going to bring home a lot of new technologies. So you can aspire to build such structures. That's one. But it doesn't solve the problem because in solar cells, you have these small units, which has to continue go, going on and on and on. It has to work for 10, 20, 30 years. Plants have a way to regenerate their chromophores. Plants have mechanisms of photoprotection. Solar cells will not have that active programming to you know, regenerate these. So this has a problem. So if I look beyond this, what are my options? My options are, if I can, for every photon, generate two excited states or three excited states, not just one. I can make use of one of those out of those three to generate um, electricity. So is there a way out for this? Well, Viktor Klimov, and I think some of you know, physics community will know this guy, Viktor Klimov, had, gen had generated quite a bit of blue in 2000, 2004, 2005 where he reported for the first time in, as in quantum dots, there is a possibility of generating two excitons per one photon absorption. After three, four years of struggle as nobody else in the community could reproduce his results, Bawendi in uh, MIT had reported that all of this is completely false, uh, sort of misinterpretation of the data. And it took, took people time to equilibrate with that, um, that paper that Bawendi released in 2007-2008. But later on, other people like Baird had shown that there were problems in the quantum dots that were being used. And if the surface um, encapsulation is done well, then when you do this, when you do photo excitation of quantum dots, there is charging process at the surface. And that charge process kills excitons, creates something called as trions, which is a sort of a, a quasi-particle with three different fundamental particles. So it is sort of kind of, um, uh, it was confusing for the literature and it took almost four years since then when they um, came up with this explanation that all this is true, what was seen by Viktor Klimov, except that the percentage fractions, the yields that he reported are not correct. The yields he claimed could be go up to 60% of multi-exciton generation. Those are actually close to one to 5%. And depending on how you make the quantum dot. So this was a concept. It, it brought in something new to the field. However, it absolutely did not solve the problem because these were quantum dots, solid objects, connected, layered on a material, but then you are charging with light and you have some electrons or uh, charged particles gathering around it, and it creates a blockade for the movement of charges. That was a problem with the quantum dots. Still, people are trying to use them for photovoltaic devices. It's still a question that has to be revisited. However, during such you know, 2000 and 2005, there was a time when people started asking, is there a molecular equivalent? Why is that? A molecule is a localized entity. A quantum dot is completely an extended system, but confined. A quantum dot talking to a quantum dot, pushing electrons around, requires a lot of uh, interesting device physics at the interface. But a molecule talking to another molecule, passing electrons, we have seen that all the time in photosynthesis in chemistry. So it's, if it is a molecule that can be used for this, 
that might be the way out. And that's what singlet fission is. So with that our entire preface, I now come to the most topical term that I used in the title, singlet exciton fission. And the idea here is I create aggregates of molecules like photosynthesis, like the light harvesting complexes. But these aggregates are now slightly different. They are packed right on top of each other, not at a distance with the orientation on a protein membrane, but these are just molecular aggregates. Not kind of surprising, shocking, because people have been making molecular aggregates from 1950s. So there's an entire uh, chemistry and explanation of how you can pack molecules in H versus J aggregates. Kasha, Michael Kasha, Lewis, Jean Lewis's famous student, actually worked out an entire uh, quantum mechanical theory to understand J aggregate light absorption versus uh, J aggregate light absorption versus H aggregate light absorption. So this was a good thing. If aggregates work for singlet fission, that would be a physics we have known, you know, we've seen before. So it will change. Yeah. So so now you have the idea. So two molecules, let's take two molecules in an aggregate. Randomly, one of them gets excited and you create an S1 state, singlet state. All optical excitations here are allowed for singlet to singlet transitions, S0 to S1. So this is created in one half of the dimer of molecules. And then you suddenly see that there, is, there are options for this molecule it could actually emit. But before em doing the emission process, it creates an interesting correlated triplet pair state. That means, and if you look at the spin state, I've marked it as a singlet. That means now the excitation, instead of getting only localized on one of the dimers, is now shared in energy in the two molecule subset. And now this sharing creates, creates a very interesting spin transition, which is both the molecules, instead of being in a singlet state, are in triplets. Yes, yeah, so there is an essential difference from your uh, biological counterpart. Yes. You are not strongly enough coupled for the first excitation to be already delocalized. You are right. talking about localized excitation, then delocalized. Right. Uh, excitation is, uh, sorry, the molecules are strong enough, have strong enough coupling, you won't be able to do that. Right. right? I agree. I agree. But which is different from it's a difference uh, in the biological yeah. context. Because in that, the, in the biological um, uh, systems, the entire problem is propagation of the excitation energy as fast as best as possible. So you equally delocalize the excitation across all the two for series excitonic coupling, and then you transfer this. So this is slightly different in that sense, as you picked it up very subtly. These are bound by weak forces. These are bound by some kind of interaction, which are not necessarily in the ground state, but it could be in the excited state and more the, pronounced. This conservation as you go. From yes, S1 yes, there is conservation. Conservation. So there is a sing. If you look at the electron configuration, you have a singlet state. S is equal to zero, right? You excite one of those electron to its lumo. So then you have a singlet manifold that is created, but then. As you put it in the triplet, triplet manifold, you have two such configurations. I have just marked it by two, but there will be another. So for one molecule, it could be up, up, and the other molecule will be down, down, because it's a singlet, overall singlet. But now, remember, the energy of this is equivalent to the energy that you put in. So that means, if my energy conservation, however energy, much energy you've created, you're putting to create that S1 state, should be evenly distributed. That means half the energy to the chromophore with the triplet state, right? So by definition, singlet fission says, I can only be done in chromophores where the triplet is half the energy of the excited singlet. So if that is clear, yes. So when you say the S1 state and it is in the aggregate, yes. it's molecular absorption or aggregate? It's a molecular absorption. So the, when the J aggregate forms, yes. already the molecules are interacting, right? So how do you do it in H aggregate? You can do it in J aggregate. You can do it in the monomer of those aggregates. Yeah. Yes. So now what I'm asking is the monomer absorption, if it is different from the aggregate absorption. Yes, you so can the, still do it. You can but, still do it. Yeah. You can still do it because you have an aggregate set of states, right? For the S1, right? 
And you can still share the energy amongst chromophores that can actually have a localized triplet. Okay, the localization of the S1 and the localization of triplet could be different. It could be five molecules on which the singlet is delocalized, but the triplet could be very, very localized to a single molecule. So that's one of the big things here that you have to think about the localization length of the excitation. Okay, so um, it could be done on one monomer, it could be done on multiple monomers, but you need to have those triplets localized. So once these are actually done on your pull. You pull one excited, unexcited molecule to its excited state, you have created ways in which now spectroscopically you can track. You can track these states because I know there is a loss of a ground state molecule. So in a spectroscopy signal, I should look for loss of ground states. And if this happens, I have evidence for singlet fission. And what would that state do? Well, it could. It could just stay as a TT pair state. But then all the physics that we have learned says triplet triplet can recombine. There is an entire vast literature that says triplet triplet annihilation happens at high fluence of photons, right? And it can create singlet states and ground states, right? So that is one way to think about the fate about the TT pair state. But there's another way. If there are thermal fluctuations and the TT pair state binding energy, is less than 10 milli electron volts, which is typically the order, KT can force these triplets to hop out of their you know, regions of influence. So if you were to now start hopping in the aggregate morphology, you start separating these two triplets spatially. So if you were to just think about this reaction that it looks like S0 plus S1 after excitation creates a TT pair state and then I can independently create these free triplets on a morphology that allows for doing that. So in hence, yeah. How far can they migrate? They can migrate microns. Yes, in, in nanoseconds to microseconds. And you can see them by ESR and stuff like that? We, yes, yes, you can. So now the three triplets are generated at the cost of one. So this is where the big deal is. It's a molecular excitation. Remember, quantum dots are delocalized excitations on a particle. This is a molecular excitation. You have these molecules that are having excited state. Now they're moving apart. The excitations are moving apart. It's a huge benefit to this, right? So it's a bimolecular process, but if you can visualize it, and this is a paper that came out recently in 2021 that shows sort of in a cartoonish manner, it's a model, that how the excitation is delocalized, right? Kalaivaran, as you asked, um, with a core center at the center molecule. And then you start creating triplets which are very localized, okay? And that actually, if you use this situation, you start separating these triplets for doing fundamental work, chemical work, right? You can use these triplets to do electron injection. You can do, use this triplet to do light generation. A lot of other things can be thought of. So this is our catalysis, for example. So this is the idea that two triplets at the cost of one. Uh, photon. So now the fundamentally going back again, what do we need? The first event is a light absorption in one of the molecules. It could be this, or it could be that, doesn't matter. And you have sort of an S1 state with an S0. Now the second event is pulling this S0 directly to T1 while S1 comes down to T1. It just walks down, right? Now this is the total, total energy of the system is energy of T1 plus energy of T1. This should still be energy of S0 and S1, right? So the energy conservation has to hold, but you have created these two molecules which are excited. Now, if you look at the electron configurations and you can think of direct mechanisms of how once the S1 forms in this kind of electron configuration, you can have a spin exchange between the spins here, such that you can directly create a, a sort of localized triplets on both. Yes. Yes, that's a great question. There are two parts to it. One is the electronic part, which actually is dictated by the molecular orbital overlaps. The other is actually the spin part. And both these parts have independent contributions to the process in different time scales. So I showed the direct mechanism. The direct mechanism operates for if singlet fission operates within you know 200 femtoseconds. Both the spins, there's a spin exchange, and 
interactions between the spin and spin. So you have to account for that in the Hamiltonian, as well as there will be charge transfer interactions between the two molecules. So you account for the charge transfer Hamiltonian, you account for the spin interactions in the dipolar sense, and you write a combined Hamiltonian and evaluate a Fermi-Golden expression. So that would give you the rate for this and sort of give you the idea of how this process is happening. And these are all in singlet manifolds, by the way. So the uh, interaction would be dipole, dipole, at least for the spin part. I'm trying to yes. write down in my head. Yes, and a charge transfer interaction for the electronic so part. Terms. Absolutely. Yeah. At least two terms. Yes. Part is like for the yes. resonance energy transfer. Yes, but kind. It's like half of it, which is interesting. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. Like yes, yes, yes. Okay, so so there, there are other kinds of direct charge transfer mediated processes where you can see an intermediate of a charge transfer and then go to this particular state. Yes, Ravi. Yeah, sorry, slightly different thing. Basically, it's almost philosophical. It's organic molecules, right? The design principles appear clear. Why has nat nature not chosen to boost its efficiency this way? Why, why has nature not? Why has nature not gone this way. Yeah, why has nature not chosen this route to boost its efficiency? Uh, it, it no. It has. No, that's not, it so has. That's not the point. Are thermal fluctuations relevant in this case? It has. It has. Um, we have not published this paper, but there are other places in which uh, people have reported that aggregates of carotenoids in membranes, porphyrins don't have half the triplet energies. Let's not talk about porphyrins, but carotenoids, which are part of photosynthetic machinery, have triplets which are half the energy, at least less than half they can do isomerization reactions using singlet fission. So nature has it. We haven't discovered it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so this is basically a bi-exiton in nature. Yes. <laughs> so uh, this is zero exon. Are you talking about like one molecule? No, these are states, molecular states. These are these are not the electron energies. These are after introducing the uh, nuclear potential. So I, I draw two potentials, but the ground state and the excited state, and I talk about the zero zero gap. That's true. So I was trying to. So you, you don't. Uh, uh, you are not saying that these are electronic excitations? Or? No, these are electronic excitations. There are two different potentials that they are going to. So, two molecular and aggregate. Yes. So, this is 0 S1, is it? Yes. Uh, yes. It's, 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 it's yeah, you can, yes. You, mm -hmm. Is it like that? And it could be. Basically the Both ways are possible. Mm. Hmm. Like that's right both ways are possible both ways are possible if you have a monomer like absorption and still in the aggregate i can still excite that and look at the singlet fission if it's an aggregate and an aggregate absorption which i have to couple the two chromophores and generate new states right or in the in the localized basis of these states still defined as zero and s1 it both can happen both the other thing which yeah. I was thinking is that normally the triplet states will have a higher energy compared to the singlets. Triplet states have higher energy is um, in certain organic molecules, absolutely correct. But in places very aromatic systems, you, you, your spin exchange integral, the Coulomb integrals, have a favorable energy because they can be spatially delocalized and uh, these electrons and you, a flip is not very energy uh, sort of intensive. So, right. So, if you want to have that kind of a scenario, so you need to have a certain kind of interaction within the molecule. Yes. Otherwise, I mean, absolutely. Because the absolutely. To each other. Yes. These are two possible mechanisms. It depends on how the molecules are packed. What is the orientation between the electronic? Yes. 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 Oh. yes. Electronic states. Right. So, so this is. Oh. Are uh, not necessarily. Dyes, for example. Yes, most dyes you have a lower triplet state because of this additional energy benefit of this exchange coupling, right? But uh, these are really low. These are really low. These are half the energy. So only special molecules have that. Now, um, Jyotish, I have a question. Yeah, the host. The host. Oh, oh, yes. okay. Sure, 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 sure. Yes, yes. Yeah. See, I have a question. See, when this triplet pair is formed. They are the uh, next, for example, uh, nearest neighbor molecules which are interacting with each other. Right. But now you said that the thermal fluctuations actually make them uh, get separated and move around, right? right? Now, I can imagine in this particular scenario, there must be some coherence yes. between the two. Very good. What happens to this coherence when this thermal fluctuation takes it around? 
the coherence rephases out yeah. uh, in few picoseconds. And that I'll just come to that. That's a fantastic question you've asked. I, I just wanted to just define a few things. There, there are these energetic requirements for uh, the total singlet energy versus triplet energy. That is a requirement for the singlet fission process. The other requirement is what Shudipto was asking. What is the Hamiltonian? So this has to be defined, the singlet fission Hamiltonian. It has to couple two states, the S1, S0 wave function to the TT wave function. This could have a very spatially delocalized wave function. This could be very localized. So this matrix element is critical and you have to evaluate that matrix element to get the rates. Okay, so now let's let's just quickly uh, uh, surface the history of this process. Singlet fission has been reported in literature not as singlet fission, but as an observation of fluoresce delayed fluorescence in anthracene crystals, as well as in tetracene crystals, in crystalline anthracene and crystalline tetracene. There was a report in an Indian first author reported um, in 1965 that. There, um, there are delayed emissions from this crystal, and nobody understands why. And um, the, the, the reason that was understood later on was because there was singlet fission happening in these crystals that quenched the initial excited state. And then when the TT came together again, they did annihilation and did give a delayed fluorescence signal. So this was reported in 65 and 68, okay, two independent publications. Uh, two papers before an entire workforce of literature came into being connected at 2019 by Mark Baldo at MIT, who constructed the first solar cell, a silicon based solar cell, which has singlet fission material and showed an advance of the efficiency from 29% to 35%. And Baldo showed that this can be done with tetracene crystals as an additional layer. Okay, so yes, Shudipto. Sorry, just a historical interest. Was it S Singh? Yes, it is S Singh. So who is the first guy who uh, experimentally demonstrated multi-photon absorption also? Okay, so he's the same guy. Because I don't know about National Research Council. National Research Council in yes. Canada, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. He's the same guy. He's in uh, naphthalene crystals. Or Nothing to say. He's in anthracene also. So. I see. So it's amazing. Yes. <laughs> you know about that. Okay. So, um, and, and um, so anyway, so the 29% went to 35% with Baldo's really mammoth work. Um, and that said to everyone, including us, this particular method has some legs for application. Because if I can remove these triplets from each other, not seeing each other, you can really inject it and increase currents. And um, this was the idea. Baldo showed that you have a singlet fission material, you have an important solar cell material. Both of them absorb light. Okay. Charges are being generated directly in this, but there is an onset of charge from this material as well towards the electrodes. And that added current really boosted the solar cell efficiencies. Okay. Um, now, coming back to a little bit of chemistry. I don't have much time. It seems like the 45 minutes are gone. So I would request 15 minutes more. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so this is the, uh, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> so, yeah. What you are doing is that you are using a higher energy a laser or whatever source you have. You are exciting to say S0 to S1 and allowing it to have this kind of singlet fission that you are talking about. Now, if I think of about the efficiency of this kind of process, which is more like a secondary process, it would be, I mean, the efficiency will be much lower. Now, instead of that, if you do have this T1 states and you say energy half of that, I mean, so what is efficiency? So the quantum is the problem, as you are mentioning. No, you can have much better efficiency because that's a fast order process, and uh, so you have the energy states are okay. available and so on. Okay. So why do you go for this single fission at all? Fantastic. So single fission, as it has been put together um, by um, uh, by you no know, colleagues world over, it has been demonstrated in many cases that you get two hundred percent quantum yield of the free triplets that you cannot get through the direct process. A direct process, which is going through the singlet state to the triplet, will only launch you into, if it is perfect, 200% triplet. But singlet fission promises to give you 200%. And that, 
why is it strange? The you have the energy, the triplets are rightly set at this right energy. So you're redistributing. What you're doing is essentially redistributing the energy and creating two triplets instead of that one photon singlet. So, so this is where the difference is. And if you can do that, that's what multi-exciton generation is in quantum dots too. The band energies at which the electron and hole will localize ultimately is say EG. Now, if you give two EG, three EG band uh, excitation energies, you can have two of these uh, coming together as electron of them. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. You see that whenever you, you think of just its probability, yeah. like when you excite a state, in the excited state, of course, the number of states that you have available, the probability is much smaller right. than the number of states that you have. State. Right. So if you have a direct excitation right. and you are on resonance, right. you have a much higher probability to have this kind of... Absolutely. Everything, everything is correct. <laughs> everything is correct, but you don't get more than 100%. So in singlet fission, you get 200%. No, no, it's not smaller. That's what I'm saying. Fluorescence is in nanoseconds. Singlet fission is in picoseconds. Inter in intersystem crossing is in microseconds. So if I'm done with the excited state, I just took it out as singlet fission and not waited for the slow intersystem crossing. Quantum yields, you win, right? So that's where the, the timing is important. You need to depopulate the excited state to go into the TT pair state. Okay, so that is possible only for a few of these classes in the chemical space. One of them is a biological chromophore. It's a carotenoid. Um, the others are all human-made um, you know, constructs. Some of them resemble um, the, the, you know, the famous C60, parts of C60, which is pentacene, um, you know, diketopyrolopyrol, which are sort of uh, uh, sort of dyes, organic dyes, which have been you know, synthesized in the 50s, 1950s, because of BASF's huge contribution to create dyes with large molar absorptivity. Um, then there, there are these classes of molecules called perylene diamides. And if I were to just um, nudge the physicist in the audience, this is a naphthalene core. That's a naphthalene core brought together. And it's a perylene, it's a perylene unit, as it's called. Um, you will get these PDI dyes, which are absolutely fantastically strong absorbers of light in the visible. And now, due to our work, we have now introduced a new class, which is NDI, which does not follow the triplet energy levels, which is its singlet energy is at 2.1 EV, but the triplet is at 1.3 EV. And this has broken the norm that you don't have to look for only half the triplet energies. In certain cases, by some forcible restrictions of molecular geometry, you can compensate for this high triplet energies and still do singlet fission. You can make it asymmetric, you're saying? Yes, you can make it contorted. You can make it not a flat chromophore, you can you bend it. Yes. Uh, different ratios. Uh, that is not what I meant. <laughs> but, but yeah. No, energy conservation will still hold. I'll tell you why. Because in an aggregate, you might have modified the TT pair state. Yeah, yeah. Like yes, yes, yeah. Okay, so um, typically you would like to sort of put aggregates together for these molecules so that once in one of these molecules you have an excitation. You, uh, we know these uh, Rydberg chains, it's like Rydberg chains. You have one of these, um, you know, light excitations. You will start doing this process as spontaneously in that localized neighborhood and you start moving these excitations across. So TT pair gets created, suppose, at this particular dimeric unit, and then the T actually runs out from each other if there are thermal fluctuations. Um, you can have these as films on electrode surfaces. This is what Baldo actually established. Uh, you can also think about these in the minimalistic term, just to understand singlet fission in dimer. So chemists can make these very nicely constructed molecular dimers where you just Optimize the orientations, the distance, and start asking how fast is singlet fission? How fast is singlet fission here? How, how, how fast is it here? Is there a singlet fission? So that in itself is an extreme control that chemists have, and people have been looking at this in molecular dimers, and of course in conjugated polymers, where again the triplets are half the energy. So this, all of these have good parts 
all of these have some not so good parts. Like if you just make an aggregate, there's no control on packing. If you were to just have dye noise, there's always a TTPS state that would roll to each other. They will never feed themselves. So there's nowhere to go. So there's fast recombination. And if you make polymers, you just have to make sure that they're poly not polydispersed, but have the same chain length. Otherwise, there'll be a problem in packing. So um, this is the idea that I was coming to. You have these schematics. Um, uh, on top is the electronic states, and the richness of the electronic states. You have an S1, S0, TT, one TT. One TT can be separated, uh, weakly bound TT, and then completely se complete separation of free TT. But then under these states are the spin richness to all of these with you can have a single tt or you can have a quintet tt or you can have an intermediate triplet tt as well because this is our two s is equal to one particles that you are putting together right so you can have s is equal to two to s is equal to zero combinations all this spin richness is buried inside this as well as um, you can sort of now think of electronic coherences once you excite between the two aggregate molecules, as well as spin coherences, as you said, electronic coherences dephase in femtoseconds, in hundreds of femtoseconds in these aggregates. Spin coherences at low temperature have been measured till nanoseconds. Okay. So these are these are quite a bit spin correlated. You can actually do a lot of interesting spin physics with these systems as well. Okay. So um uh, the the challenge has been, of course. As Kalva's question, oh, Professor Kalva, Kalva question, um, uh, um, motivated this idea that um, if I just go from S1 to T1, I can just do it indirectly, right? So how do I say if it is inter-system crossing or singlet fission? I have to detect this. I have to detect optically or magnetically these TT pair states. That's the challenge. And this has been an extremely difficult thing to do simply because optically, most of the time, the TT pair states and the free triplet states almost look similar in optical absorption. They're broad, featureless spectrum. Sometimes they have a maxima, which are very similar, the TT pairs and the T. So it's very hard to sort of evaluate these signatures, right? So this has been one of the big challenges for us. Um, I'll just skip this quickly for those who have not seen transient absorption. I'll just say a simple line that we like to measure color of molecules in the excited state. And these are the colors. These are the color spectra at different time points. As the molecules uh, absorb light and evolve in time, you get spectra, which are electronic absorption spectra in time. And these are all sort of put together in this uh, trace. Um, this is called the pump probe spectroscopy, where we measure these uh, different kinds of states absorption. And when do they decay? When do they emerge? as a new state. Um, we can also do the equivalent Raman measurement um, um, in, 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 in this institute um, and uh, where we can actually look at Raman spectra at each um, state the molecule or the material is visiting. Okay, So as the evolution process happens, you sort of look at different kinds of multi-excitonic states and uh, we can sort of map them all out with vibrational probe. Um, so there's uh, there's hardly much time for me to show some of the interesting results, but I would just like to capture uh, two of these um, uh, two of these uh, important uh, uh, work. I don't know why the picture is missing here, but um, uh, this this particular work, which we published almost three uh, two years back in lycopene H aggregates, was a sort of the starting point for our group in terms of venturing into um, singlet fission more constructively and analytically. Um, there was, a, um, so Arup Kundu, who is um, my just graduated PhD student, he is just joining from Zoom here. Um, he um, was part of all the singlet fission work. His thesis is full of singlet fission, um, uh, where he looked at these, um, these molecular systems with lycopene as carotenoids, as well as participated in one of the um, nice collaborations with um, uh, Pritam Mukhopadhyay's group in uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, uh, where we now have a way to construct, you know, make a chromophore singlet fission active by sort of tweaking its structural geometry. Uh, 
So um, yeah, just quickly, I'll just refresh, um, yeah, you know, just, just put things on, on perspective. Um, biological systems, as uh, uh, Ravi had uh, asked me, uh, Ravindra Venkat Ramani has asked, ha asked me, um, um, how do you actually sort of think about if biology, why has biology not used it? it it's actually, it has used it in its thesis of Vijay Lakshmi. We have yet to publish this because there are some controls that we have to still carry out. But it was very clear to us and to Vijay Lakshmi that um, nature uses um, singlet fission to do isomerization from its cis like tetracis lycopene to all trans lycopene. It's isomerization of the double bonds. And um, this was discovered accidentally in a membrane preparation um, uh, where we sort of shine, we sh you know, put light on lyco pro lycopene and we could generate a lot of lycopene. Uh, this was one of the big moments for us because we could see in the transient absorption spectra triplets formed, which were different from what uh, monomal lycopene would look like and give. But that kind of told us when we revisited the lycopene energy diagram of S0, S1, S star, S2, all of these told us that triplets are really, really down in energy as compared to all these allowed singlet states. And if you could pack these up in the right geometry, you could do singlet fission. Auto picked that up and um, he generated this kind of an aggregate, which we call as the lycopene H aggregates. These are actually nanoparticles of organic molecules, lumps of organic molecules, but very crystalline in some sense. Um, and we could sort of clearly demonstrate that the monomer absorption of the lycopene was at 450 to you know, 500 nanometers, but the aggregate absorption has shifted. Um, and the aggregate absorption shifted blue. And once that kind of aggregate was excited, um, sort of it was different from the monomer. The monomer looked that everything decays in the excited state by 30 picoseconds. But when you excite the aggregate at two nanoseconds, you still have signatures. That means there are long lived excited states in the aggregate. Where is it coming from? And um, after a lot of analysis and work, we showed that indeed these are coming from the TT pair states, which have a different absorption as compared to the original singlets. And there is a rise of the ground state population, which got excited. So there's something called a ground state bleach signal in transient absorption, which tells us accurately how many molecules are there in the ground state post excitation. Okay. And if that number increases, that's a process that's usually unheard of. Because you remember in my singlet fission cartoon, one of the unexcited molecules went to the excited state. So that means the ground state bleach should increase. And that's what exactly was concomitant with the rise of the TT pair state. And we could convince ourselves that indeed we have a cold TT pair state, which distributed itself after um, sort of thermal fluctuations into free triplet. And that sort of was proved convincingly by your group by doing simple triplet sensitization measurement, where you create the triplets directly without going through singlet fission to energy transfer from another molecule's triplet. And you do triplet-triplet energy transfer, and you could see that indeed the spectra all matched up. Um, we could also convince ourselves using EPR spectroscopy, polarized EPR spectroscopy, that indeed there are triplet TT pair states, not the quintet, and of course, singlets cannot be detected in an EPR in a magnetic spectroscopy. But so the triplet states were detected, triplet TT pair states were detected. This is in collaboration with Robert Bittle and Naitik Panjwani. Um, overall, we could understand that morphologies of H aggregate in these lycopenes create long lived TT pair states, which are absolutely not possible in quantum dots. In quantum dots, all that, you know, um, um, this guy, um, um, Klimov observed, uh, Klimov observed was everything on the biexitonic states decayed in hundreds of femtoseconds. Look at this biexitonic state, lives for 300 picoseconds. This makes it absolutely a practical approach and usable approach that once you have the dissociation of the TT pair states, you can make, make devices out of it. Um, this was kind of interesting just to, from a fundamental physics point of view. The triplet lifetime on the monomer is 12 nanoseconds, 12, micro, 12 microseconds, while on the aggregate is 150 microseconds. It's another very interesting result we have to understand. Um, 
And the last um, part in just two minutes, what I will say is there is another system which we now worked with Pritam Mukhopadhyay where we showed only dimers. If you construct molecules and make dimers of these molecules, if you choose suitable linking groups, you can sort of bend the molecule, the original molecule, to such an extent that you will not recognize it anymore. So this kind of um, approach was used to make naphthalene diamide molecules a singlet fission chromophore. This was already reported to be singlet fission active because the triplets were right in the half energy ball space. Um, but for this one, the triplets were higher. So it was kind of very interesting to note that there was a report which stated that a PDIs, which have triplets all well aligned, can be contorted by very, very uh, sort of sterically hindered geometry of the bridges. So these kinds of molecules have um, sort of uh, triplet energies, which are lower and lower by, by based on contortion. So um, Pritam um, actually came to us both in FCS meeting, something that Shudipta pioneered um, in, from this institute, FCS meeting where uh, Arup had gone and participated in JNU. I also went, but Arup's poster, Pritam visited, and we had the first discussions of this molecule, of if this can be done in these NDI systems. And when he showed us the crystal structure, NDIs are supposed to be flat. Look at the contortion in the backbone of the India. It's absolutely bent because of how the bridging groups are holding it. These groups are holding it. And that made these chromophores come together to 3.2 angstrom separation. And when we looked at the dynamic photophysics of it, um, we could clearly see fluorescence quenching in the dimer. The first excited state, S1, just decayed away quickly. Um, and you form these TT pair states, which uh, sort of was evaluated using uh, transient absorption. We were clearly convinced that these are TT pair states again through a, uh, through both watching the ground state bleach rise and the TT pair rise, as well as sensitization measurements with ruthenium. But what was interesting, and here is the last punchline, is it's not about the monomer energies. It's not about the how, how low the triplet energy is with respect to S1. It's about the aggregate. It's about multi-excitonic states in an aggregate. So if you do a computation of the monomer and you think, oh, this is a single fission material, let's make a molecule. That's not how it should proceed. What we are telling everybody is you construct a dimer and do a calculation on the minimal aggregate and look if there are doubly excited triplet states, which are lower in energy than the singlet state. And if that is the case, singlet fission will happen. And those chromophores, which were left out from the chemical space, can now be added in. And you can sort of tweak these multi excitonic state energies and look at singlet fission. This was the first report, and it happened in 400 femtoseconds from our transient absorption measurements. And now we have sort of looked at it uh, uh, with other kinds of dimers, uh, something that Aishwarika in the group is doing. So, uh, so at the end, the rules of the game is don't bind the TT pairs too, too strongly because then they can't dissociate, but you have to have enough coupling to make the TT pair. And um, if you can do that, you can do it for solar cell application or for catalysis. And to end, I just want to have a few lines of something that um, has to happen because it's a colloquium. And if you were to not understand anything that I said, these are the few lines that I would have as a summary. And that was the question I asked, how is singlet fission done? Two excitons instead of one, get a few molecules together, sprinkle light and give them a ladder. Any one that goes up the singlet mound shares its energy to increase the count. Two get coupled as a triplet-triplet state. Some die together, that's annihilation. Some separate. The pair that becomes free, they work as a single triplet entity. So that's how I will end. And I will thank a bunch of collaborators and um, uh, people. So thanks, Jyotishman. And before the triplet-triplet pairs, <laughs> you know, the TT pairs go for the T.
We can have a couple of questions if there are any. From Zoom? Yeah, I think Mamsi has. And, uh, yeah, I have, I have yeah. a quick one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thanks, Teddy. Very nice talk. So I was just wondering, uh, what is the role of spin orbit coupling? Yeah. Does it aid or does it, you know, uh, absolutely block it? So there's, there's this work that we uh, recently did uh, last year where we showed that um, um, the spin orbit coupling makes the pathway branched, unfortunately. So if you have singlet fission, there is no room for spin orbit coupling Hamiltonian directly. You only take the spin spin interactions okay, uh, into account for defining the singlet fission Hamiltonian. But the spin orbit coupling will independently put the system of the X1 to its own native triplet, right? Without going through the singlet bimolecular process. It's a simple monomolecular mono process, right? So that actually kind of branches out the excitation from singlet fission. It takes the excitation through that route, alternate route, and you can create triplets from there as well. So you have to be careful when you are accounting for the total triplets, how much is spin orbit contribution or intersystem crossing contribution versus how much is singlet fission. So this is actually kind of now put into literature. This is um, uh, not very well understood at this point. Uh, so uh, one thing, so this is I'm going back to what Carlo was asking. So uh, you, if you put a single uh, light source at half the energy, uh, uh, why does why is the efficiency? It not been allowed. Yeah, is, why didn't you answer it that way? I mean, oh, because, because um, you can still create triplets through the S one manifold through the. But spin you don't have en enough energy, right? If you give half the energy. So oh. I'm saying instead of a blue photon, you have a red photon. Right. And. I thought the question was, can't you have just no, I think, go down and create? Oh, this? Okay. So um, uh, when I when I have half the triplets, I have no way to access those triplets directly from the spin ground, the uh, ground split, which is singlet. That was not the question. That was not the question. It's forbidden. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Forbidden, yeah. Huh. And the other thing is that, do can I think, uh, uh, think of them? So suppose I don't have the aggregate. So when is it that we, I start thinking about the aggregate? I mean, I was trying to picture it as two. Yeah. Two particles coming together. That's fantastic. And that's one of the ways Arup, who has done this work, bulk work, explains this idea. You bring these triplets, right? If you have independent triplets, let's think about the reverse process. You, you have these two triplets in two molecules. You bring them together, right? Only at a certain distance, there is an interaction. And that interaction may be Columbic in nature, spin-spin in nature, a couple of things you can think of. But they go to a bound state, right? So... If you were to sort of think about it from that end, it's a dipole-dipole interaction from, from the two triplet particles, S is equal to one particle. And if I were to think of a monomer, I don't have that option, right? So now if I bring a singlet excited S1 versus S0, or um, ground, ground state molecule, and I bring them together, right? Again, the forward problem, this has probably a little bit of interaction, no spin interaction. Absolutely. S is equal to zero particle, S is equal to zero particle. But once you have a coupling established between them, there could be through the charge transfer pathways and spin exchange pathways, you establish the dipole-dipole interaction. And that happens in hundreds of femtoseconds to picoseconds. And they have to be in coherence, spin coherence for that. You said triplet triplet annihilation doesn't uh, compete with this? It competes. But then... So you die, right? With a triplet triplet annihilation, you kill that TT pair yeah. state. So the thing is, it can happen in two ways. One is, um, once you form the TT, you diffuse with the TT as a quasi particle, right? Or you can separate and again diffuse. You can have a random encounter again and then do annihilation. So Annihilation at the start, annihilation because of random encounters, both are possible as a, a sort of a recombination source. So the, the, uh, the aggregates are known for uh, uh, the helping the exciton to transport, right? Yes. So you have a singlet exciton hoping right. singlet fission to happen. Right. What is a com competition between the singlet exciton, exciton transport and singlet fission to happen? Fantastic. Triplets are very slow. Triplets move 
abysmally slow as compared to singlets. Um, and hence, the breakage of the TT pair state is very, very critical. If you don't break them, the hopping rates are since they are slow for triplets, they usually tend to recombine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's it, uh, I, what what I would say is singlets move fast, but if they encounter an S zero, which they can couple to, they can be trapped there for some time till the TT pair dissociates. But a singlet XLN transport itself has to encounter N0, right? Because yes, it has to. It has to. Then what is the difference between the singlet XLN transport and the singlet prison process? Yeah. Oh, um, I... so the transport takes few nanoseconds. Singlet fission happens in picoseconds. It's almost predisposed. The last question. Okay. Uh, I have two questions, maybe knife questions, no. but uh, uh, this singlet, singlet fission, this process is basically, uh, as I understood, the spin is changing mm. what you are creating and what mm -hmm. is the final state. But why not then it, this process should have some energy cost? It, right? Okay, so there's a conservation of spin still. Mm. Uh, what we have is S is equal to zero particle, S1 is zero. It's a combination of S is equal to zero particle. And we have S is equal to 1, S is equal to 1. That's a combination still coupled to be an S is equal to overall zero particle. So there is conservation of spin. But once you form this, there is an inherent spin richness to it. At different temperatures, you can trap the local spins of a triplet and a quintet. So the cost comes from the, from the KT. So everything comes from KT. Yeah. Real last question. Yep. And yeah. yeah, and the, and the thing is that as you mentioned, like, uh, like it's not like one triplet is generated. There are multiple triplets, and one triplet in, encounters with other, it will dissociate. Right. So uh, while extracting out, so this will decrease your uh, efficiency. No. You have to separate the triplets out mm -hmm. and have the um, injection from two different areas of the same film, two different contact points. Yeah. It can't be simultaneously done in the same spot. Really, really does. Maybe this is a weird question yes. because this is the age of entanglement. Yes, and you have S going to two T's. Right. So are these two T's entangled That's and punishing with them? That's a great question. I never That's a great that. question. That's a great <laughs> question. See, there is a difference. There is a slight subtle difference between entanglement and superposition. Right. Now, this, if you were to take it as a two-body problem, and if you construct your imagination, these TT pair states are fundamentally defined at the local basis. The T and the T are the local basis of this molecule and this molecule. Not from the singlet, which is actually causing that. Not, yes. The problem is, I am using the convention TT uh, to tell you uh, that, look, this is triplet. It looks like a triplet, but it's a multi-excitonic state, right? So I should think it as a single state for a dimer, not as an entanglement. Okay. However, if I go back, and ask the question, ah, well, look, if the triplet wave function is this, can I reconstruct? Yes. Then look, you can I think of I it as an entanglement. This triplet, yes. And I know what's happening to this triplet. Is that possible? Yes, it's possible up to a distance. Okay. Up to a distance. If yeah. the laws of conservation are yeah. Right, right. Of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but as they did go fundamentally like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think Dig Darshak. Dig Darshak. No, no, not question. I just had an observation that you timed your talk perfectly. If you go about six slides back, <laughs> did anybody notice this? Uh, okay, anybody else? What? Uh, go six. Go six slides back. I'll tell you when to stop. Yes. Oh no 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 no! no it's not in time. So this was a, some some lying thing, right? Ah, so you in times. I take my words back. I I, just, I saw I noticed that it was when this slide has five five elements. Talk to Carlo, say, is there a time? This is actually a time set is there in the presentation slide. Yeah. So I do thank Jyotishman for a nice, interesting talk. And I invite all of you to have a cup of tea. Nothing to do with this. Not fish and bones. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's yes. really interesting. Thank you.
हेलो सर हेलो हेलो